So thank you all of you for coming to listen. We think this is a really important topic. Uh, we know there's lots of activists in Palestine, uh, in Israel and here in the UK, women activists who are fighting the occupation. And we think it's a really uh, good event that we have put on. Um, we're gonna start, our first speaker was due to be um, Dana, who is from the Coalition um, of Women for Peace, uh, which is an Israeli-based group of activists who are doing lots of direct action in Israel um, to oppose the occupation. Uh, they particularly do quite a lot of work on the, uh, on the Gaza border, actually, uh, particularly light shows. And we've got a short, um, fortunately, Dana had a fall earlier today. She's, had, she's fine, uh, but she's had to go for some treatment. Uh, she was hoping she might be able to come uh, but she hasn't been able to come. So we've sent her lots of love and solidarity for a quick recovery from her fall. Uh, but we have got a short film clip that we're just going to show about the coalition. And obviously people can ask questions and there are people here who would be able to answer. And we will share information about the great work they're doing in the chat as well. So we're going to start with a short film from there. Martial. يناضل في هذه الأيام عشرات ألاف المتظاهرون والمتظاهرات في مسيرة العودة الكبرى في غزة من أجل مستقبلهم. نبكي من أمان سيوم ومتسول لما نشي بعض خزراء لغة بوتهم بموتهم. زاكود لفسا كاتب شلتون تسمية إسرائيلي على رسوات غزة. منذ بدء المظاهرات في يوم الأرض والذي تصادف مع ليلة عيد الفصح اليهودي لهذا العام قتل ثلاثة وأربعون متظاهرا بدم بارد. نرتخو مفجنين لم يشكلوا أي خطر. أطلق القناص عليهم الرصاص من بعيد بشكل مخطط ودقيق لا لشيء إلا لمطالبتهم بحقوقهم تصيب أكثر من ألف شخص المئات منهم برصاص الاحتلال أبرز عددهم شي خط بأمغال خزع كي يجيع أسمعنا السيرة المتصور مع الرصوة لما لم يتصور إسرائيل شولتت على الرصوة بما تلا على المتصور خنة زومير شي شولتت على غوبة معطرين العاميين البشتيين بابرين تسبب الحصار المفروض على غزة منذ عام 2007 بوفاة أكثر من ألف فلسطيني لا يشمل قتل التفجيرات والحروب بينهم 450 قضوا جراء بانهيار الوضع الصحي في القطاع أعزوا مدى تحنا مش بيعوا من التاري كوفيد ما يمزوا مين حش معك شبوي وشاتايم وشبوش في ماما بطي خوليم شكوصيم تاخت النتر وشئي يفعل لهم بخداش بطيم شاتايم وشكمو ما هذا أفتصوت بخزاء وطلعات زميم اليوم تناضل غزة من أجل حريتها ويطالب المتظاهرون بالحرية وإنهاء الحصار نساندهم من هنا من وراء الجدار فلسطينيات ويهوديات سوليداريو تيم آزا سوليداريو تيم آزا نتضامن مع غزة نتضامن مع غزة قلوبنا مع غزة Okay, thank you uh, for that. So that was just a short film clip with some of the women there at the coalition. Um, myself and many other trade unionists have been out, have been very privileged to meet with the group out there and see the fantastic work that they are doing. And I know they, like many other organizations out there, are really struggling at the moment post lockdown um, with the situation but they are keen to get going again and uh, continue their opposition to the occupation. So uh, again, I'll send our best wishes to Dana. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing her soon. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Lee James. She's the Equalities Advisor at ASLEP. Um, so last year, the uh, Women's TUC had a motion at their conference, in fact, not last year, the year before, uh, calling on the TUC to organize a women's delegation. And um, it took a bit of time, but eventually that women's delegation took place. And Lee, uh, along with Zita, who will be speaking later, are two of the women uh, that attended that delegation. It was led by Philippa Harvey, who is now the chair of the uh, Women's Committee. Uh, I think Philippa might be on the call somewhere, so hopefully I'm sure she'll have some questions and thoughts about that. Um, that delegation, but I know it was an extremely powerful visit for those women 
Um, and Lee is going to talk to us a little bit about her experiences and I'm hoping people will have some questions for them uh, going forward. So Lee, it's lovely to see you. Thank you for giving up your time this evening for us and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks Louise. So um, yeah, as Louise said, I was lucky enough to take part in the um, first uh, all-female UK trade union delegation to Palestine. Um, so we went over in April last year. Now, like a lot of trade unionists, I was aware of the situation in Palestine. I'd been to fringe meetings at TUC Congress, at Women's Conference, stuff like that before. Um, but when we actually got there, when you actually see for reality, it's a very different experience. Um, so trade unions were represented from all different sectors in this country. And we it was a slightly different delegation in that we met with organizations that were predominantly concerned with the welfare of uh, women and children in Palestine. Um, and what I wanted to do was we met with a lot of different people. It was a really packed schedule. So we met with a lot of different people um, and we met some really inspirational people. But I just wanted to speak a little bit about two people that probably touched me the most while I was there and had the biggest effect on me. Um, so the first person I wanted to speak about was um, Manal Tamimi, who we met when we went to Nabu Saleh. Now, um, she was really kind. She invited us into our house, a whole delegation. So there was like 13 odd women sitting in her front room. Um, so the first thing you notice is when, you, when we went into her house, it's just an, an ordinary home, but outside um, they've got their garden and in their garden, there are all tear gas canisters, which they have, put in with the flowers to try and make something beautiful out of something ugly is what she told us. So we went into her house, sat down in her front room, um, we got given a cup of tea, all her kids were in the kitchen, there were some of them playing on the computer, it was just you know like any of our homes. Um, and we met her husband as well who's actually a journalist and who um, makes films about what is actually happening in the region as well. And so we actually managed to watch one of his films while we were there. And um, it, was, it was quite a surreal experience because we were just sitting in a home where the kids were like doing stuff in the kitchen and we were watching this film about what it's like to live in Nabu Saleh under occupation. And, and it was brutal that, you know, it showed um, just villages being attacked for no reason their houses being tear gassed, they're being raided in the middle of the night, um, skunk water being sprayed at their buildings as well. Um, and and I, won't, I won't lie, you actually do see someone being killed on the film and it was an extremely hard watch. Um, and I think it really affected a lot of us that were on the delegation, but this is the reality of life for people in Palestine. Um, so we watched, we watched the film and then she went on to explain that in the village, what they do is, on a, I think it's on a Friday, every Friday they have a silent march through the village, which is to protest occupation. And the thing that really got to me the most is she said that at the beginning of the march on every Friday, they all say goodbye to each other because they don't know that by the time that the march is finished, whether or not somebody will be arrested or injured or even killed. So they, they say this kind of quiet goodbye to each other. Um, and I think the thing that you can really take from this is that um, it's dangerous for them to invite people like us into their homes, to speak to us about the situation. Um, just the night before we got there, their house had been raided in the middle of the night. Whether or not the soldiers knew that we were coming, I don't know. Um, so when we were there as well, one of her sons was there, but the other son was actually in prison um, and they didn't know where he was or when he was going to be released. Her husband has been to prison. She herself has been shot before. Um, but despite all of these things that happened to them and to the threats to their own personal safety and ultimately to their life, they continue to try and get the message out about what life is like in Palestine under occupation. Um, and they're really humble about it as well. We were all quite upset and um, they were just like kind of accepting that this is life but we want you to tell our story to the rest of the world to get the word out so that people understand what it's what it's really like for us to live here 
Um, and they didn't want our pity and they didn't want the tears that they were. They just wanted us to be able to share their stories and to campaign for them and to show them solidarity, really. Um, so that was, that was one experience. And then in a, quite a contrast, really, um, we met a, a, a young woman, she's only 27, called Mona Delam. And she runs a place called the Alterfuck Centre in Janine. Um, and so basically, Mona and her family have bought a building and they've turned it into um, a, a school and a nursery for children from the refugee camp. This is a huge refugee camp. 14,000 people live in this refugee camp. You, I couldn't comprehend the size of it until, and we only saw this tiny little part as well. Um, now, Mona's sole aim is to give these children a little slice of normality in when they live in a refugee camp under occupation so it's a, a place where these children can go and they can actually be children um they can play they've got a little playground on the roof they can read books they're teaching them english because they think it's really important to try and help them to advance by giving them a skill so english is it but really as well these children are all very poor and have very little so she gives them clothes when they get donations they buy clothing for them this is a place where they got a hot meal and she told us the stories about quite a few of the children and it would be things like a child was stealing soap from the toilet because they didn't have any soap at home because they were too poor and they couldn't afford to buy it or they don't often get to eat meat um because it's so expensive and so I think there was a special treat and they gave them some meat and some of the children would put it in their pockets to take home to share with their family because they didn't want to be the only people um, getting this special little treat and so um, and they do things like parties and things like that and it was just a really nice place it was quite um, when we first walked in, a lot of the children were really scared of us um, because they called us white faces and obviously the soldiers have white faces as well. And quite often for these children, the only white people that they would have met would have been soldiers that are busting into their houses in the middle of the night to take away their older brother or their father and the rest of them. So, um, but they did, they did come around and it was a really touching moment. And for me, they're two things that have stayed with me quite a lot and they're very contrasting. And it's two women who are both resisting the occupation, but doing it in very different ways. Um, and like I say, that did stay with me. Um, and I think as a trade unionist as well, the other thing that I wanted to mention was that um, we were really lucky. Not all of our delegation got to do this, but I actually got to go to Ramallah for May Day. Um, and for me, like having spent many May days in London doing the parade, at, like the march through London and demonstrating in Trafalgar Square, it was a really special time. So we went across and it was full of noise and dancing and bands. But ultimately, it was full of people that were members of a trade union. So um, it was organised by the PGFTU, which is kind of like the Palestinian version of the TUC. And... Um, they were there and they were campaigning for things that a lot of people here campaign for. So it was like, the, you know, finding work. The minimum wage for Palestinians is a quarter of the minimum wage for Israelis. They weren't allowed to strike. Um, so they were campaigning for stuff like that. It was unemployment really high over there. I think they said at the time we were there, it's about 60%. Um, and discrimination is not recognized in law so you can discriminate to people so they were there and it was just like a rally here everyone was getting up on the stage and they were making their speeches and it was really nice to see as well there were female trade unionists there too and quite prominent female trade unionists um so for me that was a really big highlight of going to because as a trade unionist may days like our day and i got to spend it in ramallah um and it, it was just it was amazing um and then since I've come back, it's it's really, I've, well, basically before, I didn't even know, so I live in Luton and I didn't even know that we had um, a local branch of the, the PSC. So I've come back, I've got involved in the local branch. We've done an event um, where we spoke about our delegation and a couple of the other women did. And they were really pleased because it got to engage with some different people because quite a lot of women came along to listen to, to us speak. Um, and then through ASEF, through our trade union, myself and my colleague, Debbie Ray, 
we've um, reported back through the trade union, we've spoken at our conference about, and it's just about raising the issue here because when I told my friends that I was going to Palestine, they were like, you can't go there, you can't go there. And people automatically think about, um, I think, Gaza and war zones. And of course that is an issue there, but there are also a lot of other Palestinians that are trying to get on with a daily life, but with very limited movement, access to jobs, and you know, even things like getting water is difficult because it gets cut off by Israelis when they, like by the soldiers when they decide to. So I think for me, you know, I was able to come back and speak to people I know and say, do you know what? No, it's, it's really, really good. Um, so, it, and actually I did want to go back this year, but unfortunately COVID has put a stop to that at the moment. So um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to say a little bit about a couple of the different minute, women that we met, like I say, um, there were a whole host of them, but these were two people that really stuck out in my mind. Um, and if anybody gets an opportunity to visit Palestine or to go on a delegation, I would really, really recommend it. Thanks, Lee. That was uh, really powerful. And I always find it really powerful listening to people talk about what they have seen and things. And they are both extremely um, uh, powerful and impressionable women who had a big impact on me too. It's very interesting what you said about um, the children. We visited, visited a school in Hebron, which had just been attacked by soldiers. And when we went in, one of the children started crying and it was because he thought we were Israeli settlers and we were there to harm him. So, you know, it does have that impact. It's very traumatic for children and young people, uh, the whole everyday life experience for them. So we're going to move on to our next speaker, who is Samia Albotme, who's from, uh, who's a, a professor from the um, university, um, uh, Bazaar University. Many of you, I'm sure, will have heard Samia uh, speak before, and she uh, she's extremely knowledgeable, and we always learn a huge amount from 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 her. She is also going to talk a little bit about the annexation towards the end of her presentation. We thought that would. It's quite a big issue at the moment. It would be useful for people to hear about that. So I'll hand over to you, Samia, and then um, we'll hear from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Louise. Um, uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for staying in, actually, not coming out, um, and uh, taking part in this uh, webinar uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm going to speak a bit, as Louise noted, uh, on two issues. Uh, the, one, the first one is women's lives under uh, colonization and uh, the manner with which Palestinian women resist, but also a bit on the annexation because it's the latest form of oppression and uh, advancement of colonization that Israel is using to uh, uh, annex further land, but also uh, uh, people, affecting people's lives, people's resources, and uh, people's futures, basically. Um, women's lives in, in Palestine are um, highly uh, uh, segregated in, uh, depending on where they live. So you have uh, the lives of women in the Gaza Strip are very different from the West Bank. And it's all defined by uh, uh, colonialism. Uh, the manner with which colonialism manifests itself in the Gaza Strip is very different. It is colonialism, the oppression measures, the violations of people's rights are, are very different though. Uh, people uh, in Gaza have, um, I mean, the UN noted that uh, in, by 2020, and this was two years ago, uh, Gaza uh, is, is going to be labeled as um, an unhabitable area. Uh, so th the li lives of people there are extremely difficult. Uh, getting access to uh, medical care, uh, having resources is impossible. Uh, the wars on Gaza, whereby you, your houses are uh, uh, bombed and demolished, uh, your lives are at stake at every moment, you have no mechanism to defend yourself, yet you have to go on with life. You 
you know, women and families have to bring up their children. You have to find work. Um, Gaza suffers from the highest unemployment rate in the world. Um, very much this situation, this compounded colonialism and uh, 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 suffering in the Gaza Strip, the loss of life, the repeated loss of lives, the repeated demolition of houses. The houses that were demolished in 2011 and 2014 wars have not been rebuilt. And these, these are refugees that have been displaced in 1948 and 1967. So their lives are about displacement, repeated displacement. And the impact that has on uh, people's lives is devastating. Much of the burden falls on uh, women. And this is why we see, uh, and Gaza is a highly conservative uh, uh, part of Palestine, even by Palestinian standards. We see many women going out on demonstrations, uh, taking part in resistance activities. Uh, women of all ages, not just you know, middle-aged women, but young women, elderly women, um, people with disabilities, even women with disabilities, everyone is taking part because for them it's about um, communicating a message of resistance, but also asking for uh, solidarity. And I will speak about that towards the end of my uh, talk. The lives of women in the West Bank under colonialism is different, yet it is under colonialism. Uh, living in area C of the West Bank, uh, which is 60% of the West Bank, is, is miserable, um, to say the least. Um, people's homes are repeatedly demolished, and uh, Israel actually asks people, you have two options. You can demolish your own house, or Israel comes and demolishes your house and asks you to pay uh, the cost. So many people actually end up demolishing their own houses. Israel uses the excuse that these houses were built without a permit. And uh, basically, Palestinians cannot build. And Israel, in a way, uh, um, issues all of these measures to drive the Palestinians out of their communities, out of their villages, out of their towns. Um, you know, they are devised measures. Very much Israel utilizes the South African uh, example of how to bandestinize uh, people, how to uh, deprive people of resources, deprive people of jobs in order to drive people away, to lock people into cantons. So all these measures that South Africa actually, uh, not just devised, but also borrowed from earlier colonial uh, uh, examples, Israel utilizes uh, uh, against the Palestinians. Palestinian women actually are at the forefront of uh, resistance uh, to these measures. Uh, the vast majority of workers in the agricultural sector are women. Agriculture is at the forefront of uh, resistance. Israel has this, um, it's really very arbitrary uh, rule. If, if land is cultivated, uh, it takes more measures from Israel to confiscate the land. And women uh, very much of the time cultivate their land to protect it. Uh, agriculture doesn't pay here in Palestine for many reasons, uh, but many women in particular cultivate their land at a loss to protect it from confiscation. And uh, this is why we find many women workers in the agricultural sector who are very poor, but they persevere, they persist, because for them, not working the land, not cultivating the land, very much means confiscating the land, uh, Israel confiscating uh, uh, the land. Um, the, uh, we have marches in the West Bank, like the march, the return march in Gaza that takes place every Friday. Now it has stopped because of COVID-19, but in the West Bank, we have these marches that take place uh, along the wall um, in many villages in the north of Palestine to uh, the south. Um, 
And these marches are very much organized by women, um, not just in terms of taking care of uh, uh, the crowds and uh, uh, enabling them to uh, come into the villages and directing them. Women plan these marches, work in planning, in, in strategizing these, uh, these marches. And uh, this is why we get very many women arrested also in, in, in the marches. Um, also, there very many women are uh, active in um, resisting colonialism through um, uh, measures that try to um, bring life uh, normality to, to people. Lee explained, you know, the issue of offering refugee children uh, a proper meal or uh, taking children to an outing. Um, very much uh, women organizations do that. Uh, for example, women prisoners, taking out women prisoners, ex-prisoners to walk with their children. Very many of these women do not know their children. So uh, women, very m women organizations, very much of the time, um, uh, in a way, organize these activities to enable both women prisoners and uh, their children to um, become more acquainted and uh, more normally. Um, there is also the role of women in strategizing um, non-violent or non, non, um, uh, very simple forms of um, uh, resistance, uh, including BDS. Um, uh, there are very many women, actually the vast majority of uh, BDSers here in Palestine strategizing uh, on BDS are women. Um, so they are at the forefront of uh, resistance. Uh, Israel realizes that, and uh, this is why we find the number of Palestinian women prisoners rising. Um, just three months ago, we had one of our students at Birzeit University arrested. Uh, she's a 19-year-old girl, you know, and she's part of the student union. She was arrested for um, uh, voicing her opinion on uh, online, I think Facebook. Um, now Israel keeps on renewing her arrest uh, every couple of months. And, uh, um, you know, no one knows how long will she be arrested uh, for. Um, at the same time, Israel also uh, uh, uses women to uh, interrogate family members. A colleague of mine, she's, she works in the media studies department. She was used, she's a 60 year old woman. Um, she's, a, she's, she's very well known for resisting Israel's uh, colonization. Her son was uh, arrested. And upon the arrest of her son, she, uh, was arrested and she was used to threaten her son uh, uh, if he doesn't uh, admit to whatever they want him to that she will be harmed. So women are in a way are used and of course I mean her son uh, uh, didn't cooperate she uh, also didn't uh, cooperate with them trying to use her to put pressure on her son. Eventually her house was demolished. Uh, they accused her son of uh, threatening the security of the state of Israel and uh, her house was demolished. She stood uh, um, uh, high in the face of the house uh, demolition um, she was, in a way, sending messages to her son in prison that he should just take care of himself. You know, the house can be rebuilt. And, you know, this is a family. It's a very old house. It's a 200-year-old house. So Israel tries, in a way, to undermine communities through undermining women. But women have been at... Uh, uh, the resistance to Israel's colonialism has been uh, innovative, has been uh, creative, and is um, evolving, actually, uh, over time. 
Um, and this is why Israel has been putting a lot of pressure yesterday on women. Yesterday there was a big march in Jericho uh, against the annexation. And, um, and the, the marchers there, the speakers there, uh, were uh, women um, in a way providing their insights into how to resist. And um, as I said, the resistance is not just about um, engaging in demonstrations. It's about what women do to protect the land, protect their families, protect themselves, and in a way, keep the memory of what is Palestine, uh, our lives as Palestinians, our culture that is being threatened and actually uh, falsified by Israel, including our history, our so women play a huge role in um, maintaining that, in strengthening it, and in keeping Palestinian society steadfast. I will talk a bit about the annexation because, in a way, and I will share, um, I will share the map of annexation that Israel has been um, has been putting through. And this is the map of the West Bank. This one is the map of the West Bank. On the side, this is the map of Gaza. Um, you can see the light yellow here on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, this is the Jordan Valley. This is the borders with Jordan. All this area is a uh, subject for annexation, which is huge. It's, it's it comes to 33% of the West Bank. You can see also these yellow parts, um, all of these uh, are areas subject to annexation. These are basically areas around um, settlements. Settlements are uh, usually uh, are very small in size, but the land annexed around them is, is huge. So this will basically displace or cantonize nearly 75 Palestinian villages and affect nearly 120,000 people. It affects 120,000 people, but affects the lives of the 3 million Palestinians because this is where we cultivate. This is the land, you know, these are, these are the lowlands of Palestine, but they are very flat and they're full of water. So Israel is annexing our gardens, basically, uh, our uh, water resources. Um, and, and that's going to deprive the Palestinians of uh, um, uh, much of their uh, livelihoods. And it will make our lives much more difficult geographically, because you can see we're basically surrounded totally. We are cantonized. All of these little areas break up Palestinian territories. So this will it will become really very much the South African example, uh, the townships where people are crowded in small areas and cut off from all uh, uh, capacity to survive, and uh, and that will uh, uh, basically Israel hopes it will drive Palestinians out uh, when they have no resources, no jobs, um, with raids, with uh, uh, with raids, with uh, 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 oppression. Uh, the aim is to uh, drive as many uh, Palestinians out as possible. And of course, for us as Palestinians, uh, we understand that. And because uh, of that, we resist. We resist in many ways. Uh, including demonstrations, including um, uh, activities to create a sense of normality for our children and uh, our everyday lives. But more importantly, we use BDS. And um, BDS, as many of you have been active in BDS, I, I want to stress the importance of BDS against uh, Israel's uh, annexation. It's because it's a tool that brings us Palestinians living under uh, Israel colonialism together with the 
uh, uh, with uh, people who stand in solidarity with us around the world. And um, I would ask you to please intensify your efforts to put pressure on Israel through economic uh, 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 boycotts, uh, through sanctioning Israel's arms, Israel's trade agreements, uh, through using trade unions to pass motions to isolate uh, uh, Israel around uh, the world, be it in academic institutions, in economic forums, um, also sports and culture. Um, in a way, we understand that our resistance uh, will go on for long. Uh, this is a lesson that history teaches us, uh, that basically if you resist and you continue to resist, colonialism will end. And we believe in that as Palestinians. And this is why we uh, persevere. And this is why we devise mechanisms to resist Israel. We need your solidarity uh, in resisting Israel's colonialism because the fight is one. The fight is against racism, is against oppression, is against uh, violations of uh, human rights. Um, we do stand in solidarity as Palestinians with other struggles around the world, and especially these days with uh, uh, Black American, American struggle uh, against racism in, in the US, uh, with the indigenous people's struggle around the world. Um, so we do consider our fight to be one. And uh, for that, it is important to stand with all these struggles and we look to your solidarity and your support in our struggle. Thank you. Thanks, Samia. That was uh, an extremely powerful account, as always. Um, a couple of people have asked in the chat about the map. I think somebody has already shared the link where you can get it, but we can uh, share it anyway by email. And Samia has said she will send that to us. So we'll make sure we send it out with other things from the chat. Um, just a couple of things before I move to our last speaker. Somebody also asked in the chat about whether we're calling for any national action um, around the annexation and opposition to it. So PSC is calling a national day of action uh, on Saturday the 4th of July and we'll be sending out more information this week. But also, I again encourage people to make sure if you're not a member already, please do join Palestine Solidarity Campaign. The link is in the chat. Make sure you affiliate your organizations to PSC uh, and get involved in all of our actions. We have quite a lot of online actions at the moment because we can't meet physically. So make sure you check out the website regularly. There's lots of updates of ideas and things that you can do. Um, but yes, thank you very much, Samia. It's always an honor to be in your company and hear from you and your extreme knowledge of the situation. I've got a couple of questions for you, but I'm going to take our next speaker and then I'll come back to your question. So our final speaker is Zita Holborn. She also went on the women's delegation from the TUC. She's PCS vice president very well known in the trade union movement, a very vocal and uh, a speaker, uh, very knowledgeable. She's also the co-founder and chair of Barrett UK. And I know she's been doing huge amounts of work around the Black Lives Matter movement at the moment, uh, but also is regularly speaking out about the situation in Palestine. So it's a real pleasure to have you with us, Zita, and thank you for giving up. I know how busy you are. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Zita, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, greetings, everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, thank you for inviting me to speak at this event. As has been um, mentioned, I was part of the um, All Women's Delegation to Palestine, but I have been supporting the PSC and the people of Palestine for many years. Um, in addition to my activist roles, um, I'm involved in the creative sector, the cultural sector, and I'm a visual artist and performance poet. So I've been working with Palestinian poets and doing fundraisers for the PSC and creating art and putting on exhibitions to draw attention and bring attention to the struggles of um, Palestinian people and to bring uh, solidarity. Um, the delegation that we took to Palestine last year was um, historical and important. Um, 
And I would say that it's historical because it was an all women's delegation and it was the first of a kind um, uh, trade union all women's delegation going to Palestine. But it was important because um, the strength of connecting women with women, I think, meant that the messages we brought back to the UK and the work we did back in the UK really um, connected with um, women here um, because they could relate, even if they've not never been through anything as horrendous as women in Palestine are going through, they could relate to that struggle um, as women. And we met women that were incredibly, incredibly strong everywhere we went. We witnessed the strength of women in Palestine firsthand. We saw it in um, the Women's Coalition of Peace. We saw it in the women and girls of Nabi Saleh. We saw it in the Women's Centre and Nursery in Jenin. We saw it in the mothers fighting to protect their children, but also their existence and their land and their futures at the same time as knowing that tomorrow is not guaranteed. Um, as women globally, uh, we're protectors of families, we're the people that hold families together, but also hold communities together. Um, and we um, work to ensure that those communities and our networks and our families are connected together, are safe. We, we're the ones that create safe spaces for our communities and lead uh, on doing that. Um, and I think there's no stronger force uh, than a mother protecting her child. You will fight tooth and nail to protect your child, but also to protect your child's uh, future. So I would say that the, the women of Palestine are freedom fighters because actually just carrying on and trying to get on with day to day life and trying to make things as normal and regularized for your family, for your children, for your community, is in itself an act of resistance. Um, and so the women we met, these are women who have been through untold pain and untold struggles um, and have had to live, you know, young women who have had to spend their whole life in that struggle. They've never known anything different, or not just young women, you know, women of all ages who've never known anything different. And even though they're bearing um, the, the scars of what they've been through, um, they are really determined um, and they are the people that are taking us forward. And they actually, they gave us strength. So, you know, we go through struggles and battles in the UK. We face uh, gender discrimination as a black woman. I face racism and gender discrimination, but we actually gained a lot of strength by being with those women and seeing what they go through and how they fight and how they stand up for their rights and how they get up every day and keep going in those circumstances. So back in the UK, having had that um, first-hand experience of meeting with women and not just women obviously we met with men and women but our focus was on women's groups and, and women uh, uh, in Palestine um, you know I came back and I tried to share that experience that first-hand experience of what I'd seen and heard um, with as many people as possible so in the trade union movement in community activism um, doing presentations at our trade union conferences, our women's seminar. I regularly um, update, I chair the PCS National Women's uh, Committee and I regularly update our committee on what's happening in Palestine and what we can do and how we can support and how we can give solidarity. Um, you know, rather than it just all being channeled through our international committee and the work that our international committee does, which I also chair, which is obviously also very important, um, but bringing in the experience from a different perspective, uh, I think was important. I'm also um, the joint national chair of the Artist Union England. And last year at TUC Congress, our union um, uh, put forward a motion to the Congress, a solidarity motion with Palestine. And even though I wasn't the person that moved it, 
um, I did speak and second it from the PCS union, I received um, death threats and abuse and hate mail for having for our union um, having put that motion up. And some of the um, uh, abusive messages that came through were asking, well, your artists, you represent artists, what has Palestine got to do with you? Well, actually, we're trade unionists. It doesn't matter, you know, who we represent and what kind of workers we represent. Our, our delegation to Palestine was very, very diverse, representing all sorts of workers across the board. But more important still, we're human beings. So we care about human rights and humanity and equality and justice. So the idea that because we were an artist union, it wasn't relevant to us is just uh, nonsensical. But I think it's no, um, you, you know, it's no coincidence that even though I was, it was a man that moved the motion, the person who was targeted for the most abuse was me as a woman and as a black woman. And when we were in Palestine, um, the delegation was nearly all white, but there were two of us who were black women on that delegation. From the time we stepped off the plane, we experienced firsthand the difference in treatment um, in Israel when we stepped off the plane, plane, because it was us that were scrutinized and questioned when nobody else was. But we also had encounters and experiences um, while we were there. Um, so one of the things that I've been asked to speak, speak about, and actually Samia has touched on it, in fact, in her contribution, is about the connection between Black Lives Matter and the struggle for, for peace, equality and justice in Palestine. And I want to share with you, if it will show on the screen, if I hold it up to my computer, this is a poster that I created years ago, way before I went to Palestine. Let's see if you can see it. Can you see that? Yeah? So it's a Palestinian woman and an African woman and they're holding a sign together and which says unity is strength. So I've been creating art and making those connections for a long time, you know, um, because I recognize as a black woman who has had to fight racism throughout my entire life, that our struggles are connected. Um, you know, the, the struggle against racism and against oppression, and that's what I see the Palestinian people as facing, racism, um, is an, a global struggle. Um, and Samia mentioned about the connection with um, African-American people and indigenous people, but also black people in the UK are facing horrific racism. And I, for many years, have supported family justice campaigns, both in the UK and the USA, people who have... Um, experienced deaths at the hands of the state and their families are now fighting for justice for years and decades. Virtually all of those campaigns are led by women from that family or women who have decided to support those families in taking the campaign forward. It's the aunties and the mothers and the sisters that lead those campaigns and have to put their own life on hold to fight for justice. And so, um, yes, there is a co uh, correlation, there is a connection between what Black Lives Matter is saying and what the people of Palestine are saying, because what they're facing is structural systemic um, oppression. And as Samia has mentioned, with a legacy, not even just a legacy of colonialism, um, and in the same way, black people are facing the legacy of enslavement as well as colonialism, but it's current, it's happening now. And that's the argument that's been made by the Black Lives Matter movement and black activists who have been fighting for race equality for years, that it's systemic discrimination and racism that we're facing, that because Britain, Britain America is still holding on to those colonial ties and those systems that look at two sets of people and believe that one set of people is less worthy and has less rights than the other. And so when um, we say Black Lives Matter, when we say Free Palestine, this isn't just a hashtag, it's not a, just a slogan, it's a rallying call for justice, for equality, for freedom, for peace, for rights, for racism, for discrimination, and for oppression to end. So our struggles are connected, will always be connected, and we're stronger together when we fight back together. So that's mm -hmm. crucial that we do so. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Zita. That was a really powerful speech. I remember the motion, and actually I remember the abuse that you received at TUC. 
um, and you stood up to it really well as you continue to stand up and fight for equality and justice for all people. So thank you for all that you continue to do. I know Zita is really busy and I think she will have to leave us. So I'm really sorry that she can't stop for uh, too much longer, but uh, thank you for your a really inspirational talk. And I certainly know from my union and many other unions will know that the situation you talk about when people arrive in Israel mm -hmm. is exactly the same. People are, uh, you know, there's real discrimination against black people there and we see it with our members and you experienced it on the delegation. So as I say, uh, we absolutely support you and thank you for what you're, um, you're continuing to do. So thank you very much. Right, we have had a few questions. Um, so I'm just gonna, uh, we've had, uh, at the moment I've got three questions. So I'm gonna read out our three questions um, and then any of our speakers uh, I'm happy for you to respond. If other people have got questions, please put them in the chat. Um, but, um, and, and Zita, if you have to leave us, that's fine. And thank you very much. But hopefully you may be yeah, able to- I, I better go a bit. There's any questions specifically to me? There's um, nothing specifically pass to them on, pass them uh, well, on. Okay, if anything on, comes up, Zita, we'll I'm email you. Respond. I'm now going to speak about standing up to racism and Black Lives Matter <laughs> and the impact of COVID on BAME communities with Diane Abbott. <laughs> and thank you for that beautiful piece yeah. of art you shared. Please share it on Facebook. I'd love to be able to share it with the Palestinian it. woman. And thank you, Thanks Zita. Everybody. And good luck in your next meeting. Thank, thank you for your Bye. support. I'll do that now. So I just can't do anything. Um, okay. Um, so uh, the first question uh, is from Pia. She says, can you say something re about the differences in lives and how they organize comparing women in the West Bank and women in Gaza? Uh, so that's the first question. So is there a difference? Is it, uh, uh, maybe Samia, you would be best to answer that. So their experiences of women in Gaza and the West Bank and their, how they organize. Um, I mean, the conditions they live under, the, um, the, the form of colonialism they live under is different. Um, Palestinian, uh, Palestinians in general, including women, are locked in Gaza. So you cannot travel, uh, uh, you cannot export, import freely. This has implications for people's lives in the sense that you cannot get an education, you cannot work. And uh, the fact that uh, women uh, basically um, are uh, taking care of their uh, families, they're at the forefront of having to cater for uh, their families. Uh, if you have a, a child with disability, if you have an elderly person that needs uh, care, uh, the burden on women is uh, double and triple because she doesn't have any support uh, because of uh, the siege on, uh, on Gaza. Uh, women do take part in, in the marches, um, but cannot, for example, cultivate the land because every time Gazans try to cultivate whatever land is left for them, Israel's bombs uh, uh, the farmers. So their form of resistance is uh, managing, managing under extremely harsh conditions, managing for their for themselves, for their children, for their uh, for the incapacity to get work because of uh, the siege. Um, but they still uh, persevere. They still are very creative, actually. Very many women um, students at universities are involved in inventions, are involved in uh, experimenting uh, to create technology that they cannot import from the rest of the world. So women are being very innovative in their everyday life, but they are also, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, women are uh, uh, the part of the family that the entire family basically depends on. And again, the fact that um, many Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, over 20,000 homes were destroyed in just one war. And uh, this basically means that women have to 
create a sense of normality under catastrophic conditions. And that's very heroic uh, to just ma maintain normality under these extreme conditions. In the West Bank, it's different. It's yet another form of colonialism. And uh, women's resistance to colonialism is, is different. Uh, women do cultivate the land, as I said. Women do engage in uh, resistance activities, be it BDS, be it uh, marches, uh, be it uh, trying to support uh, families of prisoners, uh, families of uh, martyrs, um, uh, also uh, presenting a Palestinian case locally and internationally. Um, most of the time, it's actually women who are speaking on uh, Palestinian uh, issues. They are at the forefront of uh, the resistance movement. Uh, they are at the forefront of uh, strategizing uh, uh, for the movement, um, different forms, again, uh, no matter where, uh, where they are. So Palestinian women are, in a way, um, coping, but they are also being innovative about creating a sense of normality. They are resisting, they are articulating their resistance, not just in terms of connecting locally and internationally, but connecting to other struggles around the world, learning from his, the history of colonialism, of uh, um, indigenous people's struggles, of the South African uh, struggle. Um, so, um, the reality of women is, is harsh and difficult, yet our resistance is, um, is coping and trying to, uh, in a way, come up with strategies that would uh, not just highlight our case, but bring uh, a form of pressure to end Israel's colonialism. Thanks, Samia. Um, just another couple of questions. Something somebody's just asked about involvement of young women, the next generation, wh whether there is big involvement of young women at the moment. And also, could you just talk briefly about the checkpoints and the restric restrictions on freedom of movement? Yes, the young women actually are very much involved in resistance. I mean, I can see it on campus. Uh, they go out uh, on the marches, uh, they are part of uh, planning uh, the marches and, uh, and this is why Palestinian women, young women are getting more and more uh, arrested by Israel. Um, and um, that's something actually uh, that women are seeing themselves, not just, um, they're not playing the traditional patriarchal role, uh, they are uh, at the forefront of uh, uh, resistance. Uh, Palestinian women are also putting the Palestinian case legally, internationally. So you have many Palestinian uh, young uh, women lawyers who are taking um, Israel to, uh, to court internationally. So they are playing a, a very, um, in a way, evolving a role. They've always been. If you look at pictures of the first intifada, the second intifada, um, again, now uh, they are uh, playing the same role and just taking things a bit uh, further in terms of uh, strategizing. Um, checkpoints and um, movement. Actually, um, in a way, it's been a way of life for us actually to live uh, in, in these uh, small cantons where we cannot move uh, freely. And uh, women have been devastated by uh, movement restrictions much more than men. Men are restricted in the sense that they are stopped more frequently at checkpoints. And uh, they are questioned and they are arrested. Uh, men are more uh, uh, sort of uh, exposed to being arrested at checkpoints. but. But these movement restrictions actually affect women more profoundly because movement restrictions mean that women cannot travel uh, between areas uh, easily. They cannot because your journey between point A and point B is unknown. Uh, for example, you know, the distance between Ramallah and uh, Bethlehem is say one and a half hours. 
you might get there in three, you might get there in seven hours, you might get there in one and a half hours. You don't know, depending on the checkpoints, depending. I mean, this afternoon we've heard somebody who's, tele who's out in a group um, uh, taking their sister to, she's getting married, I don't know, I think in, in Ramallah coming from Bethlehem, he was shocked at the checkpoint. So the wedding turned into a, fu a funeral in two minutes. Um, so you really don't know what's going to happen. Now, for women, they cannot actually take the risk of moving because uh, they don't know when they're going to get there. Mm -hmm. And being in a patriarchal society, colonialism works to oppress women even further. So we, women have to either lose their jobs in a different city or they have to lose their education. So although these movement restrictions, uh, uh, which come in the form of checkpoints, of roadblocks, of locking down uh, entire areas, now with annexation, we are told that all these annexed areas are going to have even more uh, checkpoints and more uh, roadblocks and we will have to you cannot enter these areas unless you prove that you live there this means that we will be living in these areas uh, as we're living in prisons no one can come and visit us unless Israel uh, authorizes it so all of this reality puts the lives of women even makes the lives of women uh, much, much harsher and much more uh, difficult. Thanks, Samia. I mean, Lee, I'm just going to come to you because you have been there uh, and you have experienced the checkpoint system uh, as many of us that have traveled there have. You know, I just wonder whether you want to reflect on that, just having seen it from outside, um, because obviously Palestinians live, it with, live with it on their daily lives, but you've been and you've seen. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I have to say the whole time we were there, we were quite lucky we were never stopped at a checkpoint and physically pulled over and had soldiers come on board. So we did manage to go through without um, much harassment. I think the first time you see a checkpoint, um, it, it's, quite, you, it's quite a daunting prospect. Um, I think the thing that sticks with me most of all is the length of time that it takes you to get anywhere. So here you might be able to say, oh, I'm just popping wherever. In, in Palestine, you don't just pop anywhere, you can't because it takes you so long to physically get through checkpoints. Um, the other thing you notice when you're coming from kind of the uh, uh, side of uh, Palestine across through a checkpoint, the amount of cars that are just left on the side of the street where people leave their cars because it's quicker to try and walk through. But the traffic jams are huge. I think the longest one we had to get through took us um, maybe about an hour and a half, nearly two hours, and that was at night. So you can't really plan journeys because you don't know if it's gonna take you half an hour or six hours to get through because you just don't know what's happening. Um, it's not very nice seeing there are soldiers everywhere with huge guns, um, a lot of them very young, looking quite bored, not really wanting to be there. Um, and you go through and then obviously we, we're going through and you're seeing lots of Palestinian people just being pulled over and harassed essentially just for being Palestinian. Um, so it, it's quite a daunting prospect and it really makes you appreciate the freedom of movement that we have in this country and the freedom of movement that is removed from Palestinians just for being Palestinian. Thanks, Lee. That's uh, very important to note. And people have been commenting in the chat as well, because I think people recognise that. There's just been a question on Facebook, Samia, about the treatment of female prisoners. And I know in other webinars I've done, people have asked, because I think people sort of expected that prisoners would be released during this uh, COVID epidemic and stuff. But I don't think that that has happened. In fact, I think there has been a slight increase in prisoners, actually, particularly child prisoners. So, but it would be useful to know about women prisoners. Yeah, indeed, actually, Israel has increased its raids of Palestinian areas and homes, and uh, there has been a huge rise lately, I mean, since March, um, with uh, uh, coming into homes, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., raiding homes, scaring children, arresting both men and women. So there has been a rise in, uh, in the number of arrests, night arrests. There, uh, uh, always taking place in the early morning 
but there is also a sudden rise in raids of uh, cities. A few days ago, we just had the Israelis coming into Ramallah, shooting and you know scaring people for no reason and pulling out. Um, so in a way, Israel's measures are becoming extremely vicious and extremely, um, uh, in a way, there was there wasn't there is no reason but to come in to an area and scare people. Um, it's really extremely difficult to explain the situation to children, in particular. Uh, we usually get children to sleep um, these days under uh, right under the window because if there is shooting, uh, they won't get hit. And, um, you know, they ask us, you know, why are we doing this? Why are they shooting at us? Well, you know, it's, uh, everyone is sleeping at night. Why do we have, I mean, the, the moment um, they start shooting uh, uh, tear gas bombs, we have to rush and close all the windows. And it's, you know, it's a very hot summer here. Uh, so the first moment we hear uh, shooting, everyone has to rush to the windows to shut the uh, the windows from the tear gas. Um, when the tear gas affects the children, uh, they're really scared and they don't know why can't they breathe normally. Why? So all of this is extremely difficult. And then when you come to a checkpoint and they see the soldier who actually shot at their house in the evening, they see him or her as a person. And, you know, having to explain to understand but this is a human being so they expect a monster but they see a human being and they cannot really comprehend why this human being is shooting at me at night while uh, while i'm sleeping so the the arrest of and the manner with which the soldiers come to arrest people is they scare in purposefully the entire neighborhood so they come into a neighborhood, they wake everyone up, they shoot, they bomb, they uh, actually explode the gates, they don't open the gate. So it's a whole theatrical uh, uh, act that is meant to scare and intimidate and uh, oppress uh, people. There has been a rise in Israel's arrests. Um, and uh, I think that's to preempt any resistance to the annexation. Um, because, of course, Israel knows that we will, uh, uh, we will protest and uh, we will resist the annexation. So in a way, there has been a huge rise. Uh, the use of family members to put pressure on prisoners, say using the mother of a prisoner or using the father of a woman uh, prisoner to put uh, pressure on them has been a mechanism that Israel uses uh, a lot. Um, also the arrest of children has been uh, on the rise and uh, these children are then put under house arrest and they are prevented from uh, seeking education, especially in Jerusalem. So they are arrested for a period of time, months, then they are put under house arrest again for years or months. During the, these times, they are not allowed to access schools. So you have, you know, they're ruining people's lives systematically, and boys and girls. Um, especially girls. Girls have been targeted. Uh, when you cross over from Jordan, you find Israel stopping more girls than boys on the side, interrogating them, because Israel claims that young women have been carrying out more stabbings compared to men. You know, there are 14, 15 year old uh, children, boys and girls, but the women in uh, lately have been uh, more targeted uh, than men and girls more targeted than boys. This has be has become sort of a more visible phenomenon. Thanks, Samia. That's really helpful. Okay, I'm aware quite a lot of people have had to leave. I know people are really busy. So I'm going to just sum up now. I want to thank all of our speakers. They have been extremely, extremely powerful. Samia, lots of positive comments. We always get really positive feedback about your contributions. So thank you for continuing uh, to work with us. 
Lee, really powerful speeches about your personal experience and obviously Zeta. And obviously we're sending our very best wishes to Dana for a quick recovery after her fall. Just a couple of reminders, make sure you've joined Palestine Solidarity Campaign. All the links are in the chat. We will be sending all of this out afterwards and uh, we'll be sharing this on our YouTube channel so you can pick it up there, but it has also been live streamed so you can pick it up out there uh, off, off the Facebook page as well. Please go onto the website. We've got lots of asks around putting pressure on our politicians. And as you have heard, it is more essential than ever really that we are speaking out and talking about the situation for our Palestinian friends. Um, and we will be putting out something this week uh, around the, uh, a national day of action on the 4th of July to oppose annexation. But annexation is just one small part. You know, we can speak out about annexation, but there's a whole host of other issues which you've heard from our speakers tonight. And we have to continue to speak out on all of those issues and to con continue to fight for justice for freedom uh, and for peace for our friends in Palestine and that is what we commit to do uh, going forward so thank you all of you for coming we've had a lot of participants tonight thank you for your questions and we will be writing out to you and uh, good night everyone thanks Samia thanks Lee and thanks thank to you. all the team because there's a very big team of PSE staff who've been helping so thank you everyone and stay safe Samia and I'll see thank you soon. thank you everyone